I would first like to say that it is an honor for me to be preaching here today. Having grown up in this church, you've known me at my very best and at my very worst. And you have always loved me, and I will forever be grateful for that. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Now in Jesus' time, a lawyer was an expert in the interpretation of Jewish law. In the passage before this, Jesus has sent 70 disciples out in pairs to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. Their mission is outside of Israel, meaning they are addressing non-Jews. The lawyer, having extensive knowledge of the law, seeks to trap Jesus and asks, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Read, how much am I required to do to appease God? Rather than take the bait, Jesus flips the test on the lawyer, saying, well, what's written in the law? What do you read there? I like to think that Jesus says the you with some emphasis. This is, after all, a hotshot lawyer who believes he already knows the answers to all of the tests he's throwing at Jesus. But by asking what the lawyer reads in the law, Jesus enlightens us to the fact that perhaps there are multiple ways in which the laws might be read. Without hesitating, the lawyer quotes, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Ding, 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 correct, says Jesus. You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Note that Jesus doesn't say eternal life. He says live. Not satisfied, the lawyer continues, wanting to prove that he had legitimate reason for testing Jesus. And who is my neighbor, he asks. Read, are you suggesting, since you have begun mission with the Gentiles, that the Gentiles are also my neighbors? I doubt he is prepared for the parable that Jesus then tells him. But let's look more closely at the answer the lawyer provided for his first question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That is a lot of love. In fact, in order to love God with all heart, soul, strength, and mind, and still be able to love our neighbor as ourselves, there can be no boundary on or limitation for love. Love is infinite. And if love is infinite, then one need not ask, who is the neighbor whom I should love as myself? Because the answer is everyone and everything, all of creation, including our closest neighbor, the earth we inhabit. Because love encompasses more than we have the capability of comprehending. Love is abundant and therefore can be given abundantly. But what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Full disclosure, I have wrestled with this tenet for the majority of my life. I've fallen into the trap of thinking, okay, so I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself. But instead, I read it as, love my neighbor as much as myself. The mental gymnastics that follows goes something like this. If I'm supposed to love my neighbor as much as myself, then it stands to reason that I need to be able to love myself first, right? But isn't there a danger in loving myself? Because what if I love myself to the point of arrogance and pride? How can I love myself without falling in love with my ego, with my false self? And then, once I finally achieved all of that, 
I can start to love my neighbor. Yeah, it's a complicated process. And it's an unnecessary one because it doesn't ever say love your neighbor as much as yourself. It says as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself. As a part of your very being. As an extension of you. And this is where the lawyer and I have been trapped. Because we have been caught up in our head spaces. The lawyer's expertise is knowing the law and knowing the interpretation of the law. But putting that knowledge into practice can be very difficult. Jesus points to this difficulty in the very parable he recites to the lawyer. A man is beaten and robbed, left naked and half dead on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Both a priest and a Levite, separately, see this man who has been beaten. They acknowledge his existence, and yet they actively ignore this man's plight and physically avoid contacting him by passing by on the other side. Their concern for purity overrides their ability to truly recognize their neighbor and the inherent human dignity in him. According to the law, however, if the man were dead and they touched him, they would become ritually unclean. Sometimes being part of the establishment can lead to forgetting about the importance of things other than law, purity codes, doctrine, and dogma. Like the lawyer, the priest and the Levite are stuck in the space of their minds. In his usual way of teaching, Jesus uses an outsider, someone who is considered not worthy by the Israelite society as the model for the lesson. I believe Jesus does this both because he spends his time mostly with the outcasts of society and also because Jesus himself experiences moments of awakening in his own ministry from encounters with people considered unworthy, mostly women. In this parable, the model is a Samaritan. When the Samaritan comes upon the beaten man, the scripture says that he was moved with pity. The eye of his heart sees the beaten man on the side of the road, and rather than pass by on the other side, the Samaritan comes near to him. When the Samaritan looks into the eyes of the man, he is moved with pity because he sees his own eyes looking back at him. In a flash, he experiences himself as the beaten man, looking helplessly at the Samaritan staring straight at him. And his heart is moved, and he responds by taking care of the man as he himself would wish to be cared for. The Samaritan shows us that loving your neighbor as yourself bypasses the brain and come straight from the heart. In what ways are we like the lawyer, the priest, and the Levite, still stuck in a headspace that limits and rejects? Where in our lives have we tried to minimize whom we should love and how much we should do as followers of Jesus? We are currently living in a time where our country is highly polarized. North Carolina, too, has become a political battleground with people on both sides of the spectrum at odds with one another. And in the heat of these contentious debates, we have lost sight of who is our neighbor. From conservatives calling liberals morons to progressives calling Tea Party members regressives, to the dehumanizing effect that internet anonymity can lead to in the comment sections of articles, the vitriol in our speech is escalating and it must stop. Rather than talk to and listen to one another, we have been talking at one another without hearing a word each other says. 
which leads to broken relationships and torn apart communities. In the midst of these arguments and stalemates, the most vulnerable of our society, including our planet, have been robbed and beaten, like the man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And unless we move from the egoic centers of our minds to the wisdom wells of our hearts, we will be unable to care for and heal them. I want to be very clear. I am not defending policies and legislation that abandon and oppress the least of these within our society. But I cannot stand here and condone the way we have been talking about one another with regards to these bills either. As Cindy mentioned in her sermon several weeks ago, as baptized Christians, we made a vow to respect the dignity of every human being. We are all brothers and sisters. But it is even more than that, as today's gospel teaches us. Before I am political, before I am a North Carolinian, before I am American or German, and even before I am Christian, I am a human being. And the human in me can reach out to the human in you and say, you are me, and I am you. In a beautiful short story written by Andy Weir, a man dies and has a conversation with God about the meaning of life. After some discussion, the man learns that the entire universe, the entire universe, includes only God and himself, and that all humans are merely different incarnations of the man himself. What God says next speaks deeply to what Jesus is teaching us. God says, every time you victimized someone, you were victimizing yourself. Every act of kindness you've done, you've done to yourself. Every happy and sad moment ever experienced by any human was or will be experienced by you. On October 9th, 2012, Malala Yousafzai was shot in the forehead by the Taliban for going to school and promoting education for girls in Pakistan. On Friday, she celebrated her 16th birthday by speaking in front of the UN and calling for education for all. Hear her words. I am the same Malala. My ambitions are the same. My hopes are the same. And my dreams are the same. Dear sisters and brothers, I am not against anyone. Neither am I here to speak in terms of personal revenge against the Taliban or any other terrorist group. I am here to speak for the right of education for every child. I want education for the sons and daughters of the Taliban and all the terrorists and extremists. I do not even hate the Talib who shot me. Even if there was a gun in my hand and he was standing in front of me, I would not shoot him. This is the compassion I have learned from Muhammad, the prophet of mercy, Jesus Christ, and Lord Buddha. This is the legacy of change I have inherited from Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. This is the philosophy of nonviolence that I have learned from Gandhiji, Baka Khan, and Mother Teresa. And this is the forgiveness that I have learned from my father and from my mother. This is what my soul is telling me. Be peaceful and love everyone. The beauty of Malala's story is that she shows us the treacherous road from Jerusalem to Jericho 
while simultaneously being the beaten man and the Samaritan. Rather than back down in fear from her experiences, her heart has been moved with pity for all children who have been denied the right to have an education. And she loves them by using her voice. Like the Samaritan, the incarnated man, and Malala, we must go beyond our minds and move to the space of our hearts. There we will tap into the abundant love that exists within each of us. After Jesus tells the parable, he asks the lawyer to identify which of the three was a good neighbor to the beaten man. Rather than provide an answer, Jesus deflects the lawyer's questions both times, allowing the lawyer to respond instead. By asking the lawyer to answer the questions himself, Jesus is empowering us to recognize the wisdom we already have when we stop long enough to still our minds and to listen to our hearts. And since the answers are already within us, all that remains is to go out and to do it. And then we will live.